Well, I appreciate everybody uh, here for the Wednesday night uh, lesson. And I want to talk about the uh, book of Psalms and, and really about the first Psalm. Now, the book of Psalms is the, uh, it's the longest book in the Bible, and it's uh, comprised of 150 individual Psalms. They're not chapters. They're Psalms. They each stand on their own. And they vary in length and form. Now, King David is credited with uh, authoring many of the Psalms, and there are contributions from other authors too, such as Asaph, Sons of Korah, and some others who are unknown. Books are divided into five sections, or books, if you want to call them that, uh, reflecting a structure that mirrors the five books of the Pentateuch, or the Torah, if you're Jewish. Now, if your Bible is like my Bible, it has an outline of the Psalms, and it will set forth these five books in their composition, so you may want to refer to that. But the primary purpose of the Psalms is to provide a vehicle for expressing a, a wide range of human emotions and spiritual experiences, from expressions of praise and thanksgiving to pleas for help and confessions of sin. The Psalms encapsulate the full spectrum of human inter interaction with the divine, and that, that makes it an important source of uh, teaching and devotion. The Psalms were used in both Jewish and Christian instruction and personal devotions and public worship. And they're poetic in nature, and that makes them uh, suitable for spiritual and devotional singing. This poetic nature of the Psalms also makes them a rich and a significant part of liter literary traditions, both uh, religious and secular. It's uh, the way it got collected into a single book, it, it happened over time, I'm certain. Uh, individual Psalms were likely used independently in uh, worship and personal devotion. Over time, these Psalms were gathered and organized into a cohesive anthology of Hebrew poetry. The Psalms we have today are possibly compiled and edited during the post-exilic period. And that was a, a period of reflection and consolidation in uh, Jewish history. The Christian Old Testament follows the order found in the Septuagint, uh, sometimes abbreviated LXX, which is the Roman letters for 70. Septuagint means 70. Now, I'm not certain, but uh, perhaps the order of the individual Psalms that we have in our Bible today may be the order found in the Septuagint. It's, uh, it's an expansive uh, volume, both in content and scope. And it encompasses various literary forms, including, including hymns of praise, laments, royal psalms, and wisdom psalms. The uh, diversity of styles and themes within the psalms, that highlights their adaptability to different circumstances and needs. Each psalm is crafted with a unique structure, often including parallelism, metaphor, and vivid imagery, which of course makes them outstanding examples of Hebrew, Hebrew poetry and songs. Now, the subject matter of the Psalms is, is as diverse as its forms. It includes uh, praise and worship with many Psalms extolling the, the greatness and majesty of God, celebrating his creation and his covenant with his people. Uh, it has laments and petitions uh, which express uh, profound sorrow petitions for forgiveness and divine intervention in times of distress. Also, uh, uh, Psalms offer thanks to God for past deeds and present blessings. And of course, there's wisdom and instruction in the Psalms. So several of them provide insights into living a righteous life and the nature of true happiness and justice. And then there are the royal psalms, which focus on the, focuses on the king, often celebrating his role as God's anointed ruler and, and mediator. 
It uh, stands as a testament to the enduring power of poetry and prayer and human spirituality. Its uh, wide-ranging themes and forms make it a, a rich resource in understanding God's love and care for his own and in personal devotion and, and acceptable worship. Through his expressions of faith and hope, the Psalms continue to offer comfort, inspiration, and insight to the faithful across the ages. The first Psalm is a sublime statement of the fate of the two spiritual divisions of mankind. That's uh, the righteous and the unrighteous. It also declares the end of these two groups, both now and in eternity. With that in mind, let's examine the first Psalm in more detail. Now, of course, now we can't fully explain all that it implies in this short time that's allotted to us, but we'll do what we can. And it's just really a six short verses, and I know you've read it many times, but let's just uh, read it uh, once again. Blessed is the man, and <clears throat> notice the phraseology here, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners. This is the blessed man, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight, he's got another, uh, something else in mind. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. It's on his mind continually. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. He just wasn't scattered out there. He was actually planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf, leaf also shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. Now, the ungodly, that's the negation of the uh, positive, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord know, knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So there's a contrast between the uh, uh, godly and the ungodly. And I think this uh, first Psalm serves as a very profound introduction to the book of Psalms. It uh, sets the stage for the entire collection by establishing this fundamental distinction between two types of people, the godly and ungodly. It uses vivid imagery and contrasting scenarios to highlight the stark differences between these two groups, emphasizing their divergent paths and ultimate destinies. Yeah, this psalm can... Uh, be divided in two main sections, and you can check the introduction in your Bible. I think it'll give this. That's the blessings of the righteous, uh, verses one through three, and then four through six is the fate of the wicked. Well, the psalmist begins by describing the, the characteristics and the blessed state of the righteous person. Blessed is the man, using a series, series of contrasts and comparisons of the ungodly with the ungodly. Now, the uh, godly man, the blessed man, um, he avoids negative influences. There's, there's a lot said in the scripture about the blessings that accrue to the blessed. And here the blessed are characterized by what they avoid. They do not walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the, the seat of scoffers. All these verses do not preclude the blessed man from walking, standing, or sitting. This progression from walking to standing to sitting you know, with one one's names, that illustrates increasing levels of engagement with uh, sinful behavior. The godly person, therefore, distances himself from such influences, choosing instead to avoid them entirely. In contrast to the ungodly, the righteous person delights in the law of the Lord. 
This delight is not passive, but active. He meditates on it day and night. And this meditation signifies a deep, ongoing engagement with God's word. The godly person is committed to understanding it and integrating it into his life. He acts upon it. Literally, literally it uh, defines the man. Now, the imagery of a, a tree planted by streams of water is employed to depict the godly person. This tree symbolizes stability, nourishment, and productivity. Just as the tree yields its fruit in season and its leaves do not wither, the godly person will prosper in his endeavors. The image conveys a sense of vitality and enduring strength rooted in divine sustenance. As the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, this was true as of the writing of the first psalm, as of Paul's statement to the Corinthians, and today. The godly, uh, that is, the, uh, the blessed, the godly know God and know that they know him. The faithful are characterized by a walk, that is, their conduct, manner of life, and so forth. And that's described by the uh, apostle John when he wrote, Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought to himself also to walk just as he walked. There's our example. And of course, you, we, we could substitute the law of the Lord for commandments and vice versa and do no injustice to the meaning of either. <clears throat> Now, in contrast to the blessed man, uh, the psalmist portrays him godly with uh, stark and critical imagery. The ungodly is a negation of the godly, so we need to know what the godly is in order to negate that. So whatever the ungodly are, the godly are not. And whatever the godly are, the ungodly are not. <clears throat> So the ungodly are, are compared to chaff that the wind drives away from the grain. And this chaff is the uh, husk of grain that is separated during threshing. It's lightweight, easily blown away, even in a slight breeze. Before modern threshing machinery took over the task, grain would be tossed into the air and the wind would drive the lighter chaff away from the grain. Now, even modern machinery, I don't know how many of you have seen thrashing machines, but modern machinery uses the same process in principle, at least. I don't know all the mechanics of it, but in principle, it, this way it does it. This image suggests uh, instability, worthlessness, and a lack of substance. And like the, uh, like the uh, food, firmly rooted tree, the ungodly lack grounding, sustenance, and direction, making them, making them susceptible to external forces and deleterious influences, therefore lacking in enduring values. Now the psalmist makes it clear that the ungodly will not stand in the judgment nor be part of the assembly of the righteous. This in indicates a future judgment where the ungodly will be excluded from the blessings and community of the righteous. Their lack of adherence to divine law leads to their ultimate downfall and separation from the faithful. And the psalm concludes with a profound statement that the Lord watches over the righteous, but that the way of the wicked will perish. And this reflects a divine oversight and protection over the godly, contrasting with the inedible destruction awaiting the ungodly. And I'll expand on these in a moment. So Psalm uh, 1 sets forth a clear dichotomy between the godly and the ungodly. It, it is a classical compare and contrast. 
The godly are depicted as those, those who actively seek and meditate on God's law, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, leading to a fruitful and obedient life. In contrast, the ungodly are portrayed as unstable and ultimately de destined for destruction, resulting from their rejection of God and his divine law, or that is, the commandments. And in, the psalm underscores the importance of uh, faithful obedience and the benefits that come from such obedience. So this stark contrast in the first psalm serves as both a warning and an encouragement. It urges readers to choose the path of righteousness and avoid the pitfalls of wickedness. The terms ungodly, sinners, and scornful, or as the ASV says, scoffers, are used to describe different sta stages or a manifestation of moral and spiritual decline. Each term represents a distinct category of behavior and attitude, and the progression from one to the next illustrates a deeper engagement in and acceptance of sinful ways. So let's talk about these, the, the ungodly. <clears throat> uh, of course, we've already said this, but the ungodly inv individuals who do not obey God's commandments. Now, we tend to think of the ungodly as those described in Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse 19 through 21, and Ephesians 5, uh, verse 3 and following, and Romans first chapter, verses 18 through 32. Now, now these... Uh, so described in those uh, verses, are ungodly. This, that's true. But the ungodly are not limited to these only. The ungodly may be the nicest of people, uh, as the world defines nice. Uh, I don't doubt in, at all that you are a friend with some ungodly person. He may be kind and considerate towards you, and as far as you can tell, to others as well. He may be well-liked by all that uh, that you know of. However, he does not follow God's ways or adhere to his moral standards, no matter how kind or considerate or well-liked he may be. He's characterized by a general neglect of righteousness and divine law. Of course, to neglect is to reject. This term represents a broad category of people who live without regard to, for God's commandments and principles. Their lives are not guided by a love of the truth. Yet, as from this uh, uh, psalm, we know that they are more than willing to counsel, quote-unquote, the righteous in their ways. Now on to the uh, second uh, one, sinners. They are those who actively engage in sinful activity. They are those who not only reject God's law and principle, but also manifest their rebellion through their actions. The ungodly may uh, be merely passive, quote unquote, but sinners are active. While the ungodly represent a more general rejection of God's ways, sinners uh, commit specific acts of wrongdoing. As the translation of the word sinner indicates, they have missed the mark. So this term suggests a more active participation, participation sin, not just an occasional sin. It reflects a habitual behavior that goes against God's commandments. And you need to keep in mind that sinners are also ungodly, while the ungodly are also sinners. But here, sinners in this uh, psalm are a progression of ungodly. Sinners are further along the path of moral and spiritual decline as their lives are characterized by specific and habitual sinful behaviors. Therefore, the difference is a matter of degree, but not result. Now, the scornful, or as the ASV says, scoffers, they're individuals who not only commit sin, making them sinners and ungodly, but also openly mock or deride divine principles and those who follow them. They exhibit a contemptuous attitude toward God, his commandments, and the faithful. This group 
uh, represents a more extreme stage of moral and spiritual decline marked by open disdain and mockery. In the first uh, chapter, first verse of Psalm 1, the scornful are described as sitting, and that indicates a settled, habitual position of scorn. They are not just involved in sinful actions, but actively expressed as disdain and ridicule towards righteousness and those who pursue it, pursue it. Of course, they are also ungodly and sinners. Now, these terms illustrate uh, a progression from, of, in the decline from righteousness. So walking in the council and godly, that's the initial stage, involves accepting the, the advice or lifestyle of those who are ungodly. It re represents the beginning stage where one may be influenced by or are drawn to ungodly ideas. And the standing in the way of sinners, that's the next stage. And one there is more committed as one starts to participate in the lifestyle of sinners. This indicates a deeper engagement where one's behavior begins to align and engage in sinful practices. And then the sitting in the seat of the scornful, that's the final stage. It represents a complete immersion into a state of contempt for things righteous. This is where one not only participates in sin, but also adopts an attitude of mockery and derision towards righteous and divine law. So this progression from a general state of ungodliness to active participation uh, in sinful behavior, behaviors in finding to an entrenched position of scorn and mockery is what Psalm 1 portrays. It uh, illustrates in the increasing severity of moral and spiritual decline and this emphasizes the importance of avoiding the initial influences of ungodliness and remaining steadfast in righteousness. This blessed man in Psalm 1 is an individual who embodies the virtues and behaviors aligned with divine righteousness, devotion to God, and wisdom in all things spiritual. This figure is central to the psalm and serves as a model of spiritual maturity and, and moral integrity. So analyzing the blessed man involves examining his characteristics, behaviors, and the resulting blessings he receives, because we want to model ourselves as, after the blessed man. He's uh, depicted as someone who identifies and deliberately avoids negative influence, influences. Specifically, he does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. This in avoidance uh, signifies a conscious choice to distance himself from the influences and behaviors that deviate from God's will. Of course, he cannot avoid what he does not know and therefore uh, be able to recognize. This uh, proactive behavior highlights the importance of dis discerning the influences one allows into their lives. By avoiding these negative influences, the blessed man protects himself from moral, moral and spiritual decline. And the blessed man, he finds joy and satisfaction in the law of God. He meditates on it day and night. This meditation is not a superficial engagement, but a deep, continuous contemplation of God's instruction, principles, and will. This delight and constant reflection signifies a profound relationship with God's word. It implies that the blessed man not only follows divine commandments, but also cherishes them, finding them to be a source of guidance, nourishment, peace, and hope. Now, the psalmist uses the imagery of a tree planted by streams of water to describe the blessed man. This tree is de depicted as stable, well-nourished, and productive, bearing fruit in season and whose leaves do not wither. This imagery illustrates, illustrates the vitality and stability of the blessed man. Just as a tree planted by water thrives, so does the blessed man uh, flourish uh, both spiritually and morally. 
the planted tree has the attention and care of the arborist and the blessed man has the attention and care of the one who planted him. The tree's fruitfulness represents the positive outcomes and good deeds resulting from a transformed life. I want this aligned with God's law. The stability of its leaves symbolizes resilience and enduring strength in the face of challenges. Now, the blessed man prospers in whatever he does. This prosperity may encompass, encompass material success, even though the sinful do have material success. But he has his success because of a dis disciplined life. But it also encompasses overall well-being and fulfillment in all aspects of life. This prosperity is seen as a natural result of living a life in harmony with divine principles. It reflects the idea that alignment with God's will, it leads to a flourishing material life sometimes and spiritual life always. And of course, the uh, blessed man is contrasted with the ungodly. Uh, they are like the chaff blown away in the wind. Unlike the ungodly, the blessed man is firm, firmly rooted and stable. This contrast emphasizes the, the inherent stability and enduring nature of the righteous life. It suggests that the ungodly are transient and lacking in substance. The blessed man enjoys lasting security and success. So the blessed man is characterized by his deliverance and avoidance of negative influences, his delete, uh, deep delight in and meditation of the law of the Lord, and his resultant stability and fruitfulness. This ideal figure illustrates a life committed to divine principles, the practice thereof, and the resulting blessings that come from such practice. His prosperity and stability serve as a testament to the rewards of living in harmony with God's will, contrasting sharply with the instability and eventual downfall of the ungodly. This portrayal serves as both an encouragement and a model for those seeking to live a righteous and fulfilling life. So I conclude that here, and I certainly appreciate your kind attention. Hope it's been helpful.